O.J. Simpson had lost. A jury in civil courts had decided that the football legend was responsible for two brutal murders. In round two of the Simpson saga, the defendant was forced to answer questions he had avoided at his first trial in criminal court. Questions about the blood evidence. O.J., we've got uh, some blood on and in your car. And about his comments during the famous low-speed chase. O.J., just throw the gun out the window. I'm the only one that deserves The man who said all along he wanted to tell his side of the story became his own worst enemy. The question is, has there ever been a worse witness than O.J. Simpson? Santa Monica, California. Sandy beaches, upscale shops, a predominantly white population. The affluent Oceanside City was the venue for the Simpson civil trial. Still in shock after Simpson's acquittal on murder charges, the families of victims Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown decided to pursue another avenue of justice. They filed civil lawsuits seeking unspecified damages, claiming Simpson was responsible for the killings. If we would have gotten justice in the criminal trial, we never would have pursued the civil. But, but it was our only other avenue to achieve justice for Ron. He's still walking the streets. He's still breathing the same air that we are. He still enjoys the sunshine, the rain, the ocean, the mountains. He's still able to get in his car and go where he wants. That's not where murderers belong. Society deserves to have murderers uh, behind bars. Anybody have a seat, please? Civil justice does not include prison time as a punishment, but even though the plaintiffs could not threaten Simpson's freedom, they could attack his wealth. The stakes in the civil case weren't nearly as high as the stakes in the criminal case. But in the mind of someone like O.J. Simpson, who, uh, who values his wealth and who values money and who values his public image, uh, certainly the stakes were very high for him. Fred Goldman hired an L.A. lawyer to head up the civil litigation, 43-year-old Daniel Petricelli. Goldman's ex-wife hired attorney Michael Brewer. New York lawyer John Kelly was hired to represent the estate of Nicole Brown. They would have the benefit of reviewing transcripts from the nine-month criminal trial, which included hundreds of pages of testimony from dozens of witnesses. They could use this record to avoid the pitfalls and mistakes made by prosecutors Marsha Clark and Chris Darton. They benefited from the fact that we had gone before them, that we tried the case, that we tried some things, uh, things that apparently didn't work. I don't know whether we put the gloves on Simpson again. Okay, we wouldn't. The first crucial step in the civil suit was taking depositions. The plaintiff's attorneys questioned witnesses, including former Simpson girlfriend Paula Barbieri under oath. If a witness then changed their testimony at trial, the deposition could be used to attack their credibility. On January 22, 1996, three months after a jury found him not guilty of murdering Ron and Nicole, O.J. Simpson was forced to answer questions about his alleged involvement in the killings. Simpson, who had not testified at his criminal trial, was deposed behind closed doors under tight security. The civil deposition of O.J. Simpson was the first big event in the uh, civil litigation. This was the one that everybody was waiting for. This was the time when Simpson would be put under oath for the very first time since the murders and questioned about his involvement in the murders. The criminal trial had left behind many mysteries, questions that were never fully answered in the courtroom. 
this time they would be. Howard Simpson explained his alleged abusive relationship with his former wife, his whereabouts on the night of the murders, the DNA tests conducted on blood evidence at the crime scene, and at Simpson's mansion that pointed to him as the killer. Simpson was questioned about whether he owned a pair of size 12 Bruno Mali shoes, the Lorenzo model. The same rare shoes that left bloody prints outside Nicole's condo. And he said, I would never wear those ugly ass shoes. Well, what were so ugly about the shoes? Well, the color, the style, etc. After the deposition, when a photograph emerged of him wearing Bruno Mali shoes, size 12, the Lorenzo style, the very same ugly ass shoes that he had sworn just a month before that he would never own, he was now in a little bit of a jam because he had pinned himself in uh, so tightly in the deposition. Simpson was questioned about the numerous cuts on his hands, photographed by police detectives on the day after the murders. Couldn't explain a single cut, how he got the cuts. He said uh, one major cut on the middle finger of his left hand, he believes he got in the Chicago hotel room when he broke a glass after allegedly hearing for the first time of Nicole's death. Plaintiff's attorneys also questioned Simpson about alleged incidents of domestic violence between him and Nicole. Did you ever strike Nicole? No. Did you ever slap Nicole? No. Did you ever uh, pull Nicole's hair? No. Did you ever kick Nicole? No. Did you ever beat Nicole? No. Never, never, never. That's what he would say to all these questions. Simpson, how do you think you did? How do you think you did? What did you think of the questions? It was almost guaranteed that O.J. Simpson would be called to testify at the civil proceeding, where this time he would tell his story to a jury. If Simpson gave different answers at the time of trial than he gave at the deposition, then we would confront him with his sworn testimony in the deposition. That would be very persuasive evidence to the jury that he was lying. If he gave the same answers that he did in the deposition, those were not very good answers. Once he gave the deposition, we knew at that point he was pretty much dead in the water. When the Simpson civil trial began, many people complained incorrectly that it smacked of double jeopardy, someone being tried for the same crime twice. American justice does allow a defendant to stand trial in both criminal and civil court for the same actions. That's part of why civil courts exist. As opposed to the government charging an individual with a crime, Civil court is where people contend directly with one another. In civil court, the jury would decide whether Simpson was responsible for the killings. The rules would be very different. In nearly all criminal trials, a jury must try to reach a unanimous decision as to whether a defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But the civil jury could find him liable for murder by what is known as the preponderance of the evidence, meaning only that it was more likely than not that he committed the killings, a far lower burden of proof. And only nine out of 12 jurors would have to agree. Another rule unique to civil justice is that a defendant can be forced to testify. And that more than anything would be Simpson's downfall. Jury selection in the Simpson civil trial began in mid-September 1996. A jury summons went out to 400 people. O.J. Simpson did not attend the beginning of jury selection. He was in another courtroom 40 miles away, battling his former wife's family for custody of his two children. In Santa Monica, attorneys were faced with the seemingly impossible task of selecting a fair and impartial jury, a jury that had not been prejudiced by the televised criminal trial. There wasn't a single person on the face of this earth who did not know about the first trial, who had not uh, heard something about it, who did not know that Simpson was acquitted. Cases are often decided during jury selection. That's why picking a jury can be the most important part of any trial. Potential jurors were questioned about their views of the police, domestic violence, what they knew about the murders of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman, and their impressions of O.J. Simpson. The jury panel was pretty much completely polarized. It broke down on racial lines almost exclusively. Unfortunately, the 
procedure that the judge used, uh, we wound up with people on the jury who already thought O.J. Simpson was guilty. One month later, a panel was agreed upon. The mostly white middle-class jury was comprised of seven women and five men. Nine whites, one black, one Hispanic, and one person of mixed race. The jury that had acquitted Simpson of murder was predominantly black. I thought, I'm not sure that I want to be responsible for such a big burden, <laughs> a big task like this. And so I was a little afraid. The trial began without the glare of television cameras. A gag order placed on everyone involved in the case. And an unsequestered jury. Right away, the judge presiding over the wrongful death trial, 60-year-old Hiroshi Fujisaki, made several significant rulings, signaling he would run his courtroom with an iron fist. Unlike his criminal trial predecessor, Judge Lance Ito. He kept the lawyers and the jurors focused on the real issue in the case, and that was who killed uh, Ron and Nicole. In contrast to Judge Ito, Fujisaki gave the defense less leeway to argue that Simpson had been framed by bunglers and corrupt cops from the Los Angeles Police Department. But the judge did allow the defense to repeat the argument that some evidence was planted, including the infamous bloody glove found at Simpson's Rockingham estate by Detective Mark Furman. Say on your oath that you have not addressed any black person as a nigger or spoken about black people as niggers in the past 10 years, Detective Furman. That's what I'm saying, sir. So that anyone... This time, the jury would not hear from Furman or about his taped comments where he referred to black people as niggers. Comments that Simpson's criminal defense team used to brand Furman as a genocidal racist who framed Simpson simply because he was black. At that time, uh, Bailey was asking questions that I truly felt there was no right answer. Yes, I go back and answer yes now. But had I answered yes, would everybody just think F. Lee Bailey's just going to sit down? What, two more days of this? Uh, are we going to dissect every person that I've ever talked to that's black? This is a no-win situation. Judge Fujisaki barred Furman's criminal trial testimony from the civil proceeding and refused to let the issue of race come into play in his courtroom. The plaintiffs opened their case with witnesses who set a timeline for the murders and the detectives who responded to the scene. The victims appeared to be slashed, stabbed, cut all over their bodies. Clearly here, it was more than killing. Uh, this rage, it was uh, to get back at. The evidence showed that the killer probably walked away. Police found blood drops and bloody shoe prints leading away from the bodies. Blood on the back gate of Nicole's condo. And a single blood-stained glove. At Simpson's Rockingham estate, detectives found blood on and inside his Bronco. A trail of blood leading up Simpson's driveway and into the foyer of his home. They also found a second blood-soaked glove that matched the one at the crime scene. The plaintiff's attorneys, expecting the defense to portray Detective Furman as the villain who planted the second glove, raised the issue themselves. Not one person who arrived at that crime scene before Mark Furman ever saw a second glove, and not one person who arrived at that crime scene after Mark Furman ever saw a second glove. We know it ended up at Rockingham because Simpson dropped it there, not because a law enforcement officer carried it over there. The plaintiffs called criminalist Dennis Fung to the stand to describe the collection of the physical evidence. 
As in the criminal trial, the defense attacked Fung for sloppy collection techniques that could have contaminated or compromised the evidence. The defense also argued that some of the evidence could have been tempered with. How about that, Mr. Fung? But unlike the criminal case, where Fung was under assault for several days, this time the judge strictly limited the scope of the cross-examination. The jury also heard about crucial hair and fiber evidence, which the plaintiff said pointed to Simpson as the killer. But the most damaging evidence against Simpson was yet to come, DNA. Unlike the criminal trial, where complicated DNA testimony went on for weeks, plaintiff's attorneys made it as simple and quick as possible. All we really needed from the DNA witnesses were DNA is used all the time. It's relied on in life and death situations. It works, it's been shown to work, it's admitted in court all the time, and here are the results from the tests. Boom, that's it. Plaintiffs wanted jurors to understand that DNA tests conducted on blood evidence at the crime scene and at Simpson's home, which were compared to a vial of Simpson's blood, clearly established his involvement. When your blood's at the murder scene, you cannot be innocent. To deny guilt when your blood is at the murder scene is the equivalent of a, of a man being caught by his wife in flagrante delicto with another woman and saying to her, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? Blood drops leading away from the bodies. And a smear of blood on the back gate at the crime scene matched Simpson's. Blood found on the glove at Simpson's house and inside his bronco was consistent with his, Nicole's, and Ron's blood. Simpson's driveway and foyer were speckled with his blood. And a pair of socks left on Simpson's bedroom floor were splattered with his and Nicole's blood. Simpson's lawyers suggested that the socks found in his bedroom were tampered with. Removing a pair of blood. Pointing out that several experienced criminalists examined the socks and found no blood on them until weeks after the murders. The defense would have the chance to expand on their evidence tampering theories when they presented their case. But with Judge Fujisaki severely limiting their scope of questioning, Simpson's lawyers were becoming frustrated. By kind of limiting everything, that hurt us on the defense, and it helped the plaintiff's position. Their strategy was to really kind of cut the case down and try and prevent us from raising issues of possible corruption and tampering, and, and they succeeded. As plaintiff's lawyers tried to bolster their case against Simpson, they paraded more familiar faces to the witness stand. Limo driver Alan Park and the world's most famous house guest, Cato Kalin. But the most anticipated witness of the trial was the defendant himself. Speculation was growing in and outside the courtroom. When would Simpson take the witness stand and for the first time tell his story to a jury? On November 22, 1996, O.J. Simpson took the witness stand to explain where he was and what he was doing on the night that Ron and Nicole were murdered. I said someone should have blown a trumpet to announce that it was finally here. And just the moment of seeing him up there with his hand raised, saying, I will tell the truth, spelling his name on the witness stand, that was a moment for the history books. Simpson had been called by plaintiff's attorneys as a hostile witness. And immediately they went on the offensive, attacking his credibility, poking holes in his story, portraying him as a killer. We wanted to make clear to the jury that we had no hesitation, no doubt about pointing the finger of guilt directly at O.J. Simpson and calling him a killer because that's what he was. And if we weren't going to be clear about that, we could not expect the jury to be clear about that. The plaintiffs began by outlining Simpson's alleged motive for the murders. It was his volatile and violent relationship with Nicole, they said, that ultimately led to her death. As they had done at his deposition, 
Plaintiffs questioned Simpson about alleged incidents of domestic violence between him and his former wife. They played for jurors a 911 call Nicole made to police on New Year's Day, 1989, when the couple was still married. 911 emergency up for the 461. Hello? When police arrived at Simpson's Rockingham estate, they found a bruised and bloodied Nicole cowering in the bushes. Simpson explained to the jury that he wasn't sure how Nicole had been injured. He speculated it might have happened during their heated argument when he was, quote, wrestling her. But to this and other alleged incidents of abuse, Simpson repeatedly told jurors that he had never slapped Nicole, never kicked her, never beat her. Simpson was there sitting on the witness stand saying, no, never, never, I never did this. And behind him, over his shoulder, was a huge TV screen with Nicole's battered face on it. It was pretty powerful. The N-word caught up with, you know, O.J. Simpson never. You never say never. He asked Mark Furman. <laughs> <laughs> Plaintiff's attorneys questioned Simpson about his activities on the night of the murders. They pointed out that his whereabouts were unaccounted for during the same hour when Ron and Nicole were killed. And they said he had ample time to commit the murders before leaving on a trip to Chicago. Simpson told the jury that he was at home, getting ready for his trip, packing, showering, and chipping golf balls in his front yard. The plaintiffs questioned Simpson about how he cut his hands on the night of the murders. Simpson said he had no idea how he got the cuts or how his blood ended up on his driveway, in his Bronco, and in the foyer of his home. Though he wasn't sure, he said he might have cut himself when he was getting ready to leave for his trip. And he said he may have injured his middle finger when he broke a glass in his Chicago hotel room after being notified of Nicole's murder. Unlike the criminal trial, this time jurors got to hear a police interview with Simpson on the day after the murders, where he was questioned about the wounds on his hands. I know you got to ask the question, but you recall having that cut on your finger the last time you were at Nicole's house? A week ago? Yeah. No, it was last night. Somewhere when I was rushing to get out of my house. What do you think happened? Yeah, I have no idea, man. I, you, you guys haven't call? told me anything. It's interesting to me that he can account for a lot, chipping golf balls, walking his dog, um, but he can't account for how he got a scar-producing cut that same night. Plaintiffs also accused Simpson of failing a polygraph test three days after the murders. Simpson denied ever officially taking one, saying only that he had taken a practice test. Critics argue that Judge Fujisaki made a serious error when he allowed the plaintiffs to mention the lie detector test. Inadmissible, can't do it. There's only one state in the Union, New Mexico, that allows one side to introduce the results of a lie detector test without the consent of the other side. And yet the plaintiffs introduced evidence that Simpson had failed the lie detector test badly, negative 22, showing extreme deception, why Fujisaki allowed them to do that, I don't know. The very next day, he recognized his error and told them to disregard that evidence. The plaintiffs argued that since the defense had mentioned Simpson's willingness to take a lie detector test during their opening statement, they were entitled to respond. You're welcome. How do you feel that things went today? Simpson was also confronted with a photograph showing him at a football game wearing size 12 Bruno Mali Lorenzo shoes. The same type of rare shoes that left bloody footprints at the crime scene. Simpson, who had denied in his deposition that he ever owned the, quote, ugly-ass shoes, told the jury the photo was a fake. He said, that's my head, that's my body, that's my tie, that's my shirt, that's my jacket, those are my pants. The shoes, they aren't mine. <laughs>
Again, unlike jurors in the criminal trial, civil jurors got to hear about the infamous Bronco chase. And the items found inside the Bronco, a gun, a disguise, a passport, and nearly $9,000 in cash. The chase, argued plaintiffs, was evidence of Simpson's involvement in the murders, since he was fleeing from police on the day he was scheduled to be arrested. Simpson was also questioned about his conversation with LAPD detective Tom Lang during the slow speed chase. Lang was trying to talk Simpson out of suicide. Just throw the gun out the window and nobody's gonna get hurt. I'm the only one that deserves. No, you don't deserve I'm that. Get hurt. You do not deserve to get hurt. Lang is saying, throw the gun out the window, OJ, before anyone gets hurt. Simpson responds, I'm the only one who deserves to be hurt. Incriminating. It's an incriminating statement. After Simpson's three grueling days on the witness stand, his lawyers decided to wait to question their client until they presented their case. The delay would give the defense a chance to rehabilitate Simpson's image, which was tarnished by the inconsistencies in his story and by his inability to explain crucial evidence in the case. The question is, has there ever been a worse witness than O.J. Simpson? And if, if so, who? Every time he opened his mouth, he either contradicted an earlier statement of his own or the statement or testimony of other people who had no reason under the moon to lie or even try to contradict tangible evidence like photographs, telephone records. Terrible. Simpson's lawyers opened their defense in the wrongful death trial with a familiar theme suggesting that police investigators had rushed to judgment about Simpson's guilt and had planted incriminating evidence while illegally searching his house. They began by putting former LAPD detective Philip Van Adder on the stand. The defense claimed that when Van Adder went to Rockingham to notify Simpson of his former wife's murder, he was really looking for proof that he had killed her. Van Adder, who was one of the lead detectives in the murder investigation, responded that Simpson was not a suspect until blood was spotted on his Bronco and a bloody glove found behind his house. Defense lawyers once again pointed the finger at Mark Furman, suggesting that the police detective had roamed Simpson's property alone for at least 30 minutes, plenty of time to plant a bloody glove. Angry is a very soft term that I would use if we weren't on camera. Uh, it was ridiculous. Uh, I didn't care about O.J. Simpson. I didn't care about anything about O.J. Simpson. Like their criminal trial counterparts, the defense accused Detective Van Etter of violating police procedure by taking a vial of Simpson's blood from police headquarters and bringing it to the Rockingham estate on the day after the murders instead of booking it directly into evidence. They insinuated that Van Adder had done something more sinister with Simpson's blood. That he had sprinkled it on evidence at the crime scene and at Simpson's home. All of the blood was collected at both locations before it was even drawn out of O.J. Simpson's arm. O.J. Simpson was in the air between Chicago and Los Angeles when all of those blood samples that they say were sprinkled were collected. It's ridiculous. But the defense pointed out that at least one milliliter of blood was missing from Simpson's reference sample. And they said blood later found on the back gate of Nicole's condo and on socks in Simpson's bedroom contained a chemical used to preserve reference samples in test tubes. The defense also claimed that some of Simpson's blood was planted or splattered on evidence in the LAPD crime lab which contaminated the evidence to such an extent the DNA tests ended up pointing to Simpson as the killer. As the civil trial approached the Christmas holiday, Simpson's lawyers had hoped that their evidence tampering theories were resonating with the jury as they had in the criminal trial. They were wrong. It doesn't make any sense to me that a multiracial task force would try to set up Simpson. For what purpose? It, it doesn't make any sense. It's strange that people have the ability 
to believe something so far-fetched like that, but can't just believe that a, a man killed his ex-wife. Before the Christmas break, the defense would put on several more witnesses, including their own photo expert who would argue that the picture of Simpson at a football game wearing Bruno Mali shoes had been forged. But that testimony would soon be overshadowed by the discovery of dozens of more photos of Simpson wearing the same type of shoes as Ron and Nicole's killer. As the wrongful death civil trial was breaking for the Christmas holiday, O.J. Simpson won a legal battle in another courtroom. He was awarded custody of his two children. As Simpson celebrated, so too did the lawyers for the families of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown. Thirty more photos had surfaced of Simpson at a football game, wearing the same type of Bruno Mali shoes that left bloody prints at the crime scene. Shoes that Simpson claimed he never owned. One of the photos had been published in a Buffalo Bills newsletter in November 1993, seven months before the murders. Ironically, it was a special edition commemorating O.J. Simpson. It was just like the, the final finish to Mr. Simpson. When you have a size 12 Bruno Mollies in the victim's blood there, those were prints left by someone with that size shoe that night there who obviously committed the murders. We came up with 30 photographs of him wearing the Bruno Molly shoes. Uh, there was just no denying that, that he was the person who was there that night in those shoes. Near the end of the defense case in January 1997, O.J. Simpson returned to the witness stand, this time on friendlier terms. Simpson talked about his childhood, his football career, and his work as an actor. He also told jurors about his relationship with Nicole, their marriage, their divorce, and their efforts to reconcile. Simpson portrayed his former wife as a woman who hung around with prostitutes and drug users, implying that she might have been murdered by someone from her unsavory crowd. He also took jurors back to the day of the murders, that he had played golf and had gone to his daughter's dance recital. And Simpson refuted claims that he was in a hostile and dark mood when he saw Nicole at the recital, just hours before her murder. Under cross-examination, plaintiff's attorneys confronted Simpson with the new damaging evidence. The 30 photos purporting to show him wearing Bruno Mali shoes. Once again, Simpson denied ever owning them. It was pitiful. He basically said they're all fakes and he had no explanation. And, you know, it's like a child getting caught with uh, chocolate all over his face. And you ask the child, were you eating chocolate ice cream or chocolate candy? And he looks at you and says, no. That's what it was like. After emotional closing arguments by both sides, the Simpson case went to the jury. Jurors had to sift through hundreds of exhibits and more than 40 days of testimony. On the third day of deliberations, there were problems with the jury. The only African-American on the panel was dismissed after the judge learned that her daughter worked in the same district attorney's office that prosecuted Simpson in the criminal case. After she was replaced by an Asian-American man, jurors resumed their discussions. They talked about the blood evidence and the DNA tests that pointed to Simpson as the killer, the photos that showed him wearing Bruno Mali shoes, Simpson's credibility on the witness stand, and whether evidence could have been planted by corrupt cops. During deliberations, I started thinking, for us to really believe there was the conspiracy of planting and the lying, it's like when people tried to make us believe that they filmed the moon landing in Burbank. I mean, yeah, that could have happened, but I don't think so. Men landed on the moon, and O.J. Simpson 
cut her head off. That really did happen. And I believe that happened, and I believe that they proved to us that it did happen. On February 4th, 1997, four months after the trial had begun, the jury announced it had reached a verdict. I thought, we have sat in judgment of a man and how hard that is to do, to point to someone and say, you, sir, kill these people in the most brutal way. Because the trial was not being televised, the verdict was displayed to the media through a window on cue cards. Though only nine out of 12 jurors had to agree in order to hold Simpson liable for the murders, their verdict was unanimous. Hearing the verdict was literally for me like an explosion from the inside to, to finally be able to release that, yes! to hear him held responsible for murdering Ron. O.J. Simpson showed nothing. He was totally impassive, totally stoic, and sat there and listened to himself declared responsible for these killings. The jury awarded eight and a half million dollars in compensatory damages to Ron's family, money to compensate them for their loss. The Browns were not entitled to any of that money since they were not the heirs to Nicole's estate. We weren't terribly surprised. I mean, we were surprised at the amount, um, but, but we understood that it was a very difficult case from our side from the beginning. We wanted to win, and we, and we tried our best, but, uh, but we lost, and, and we accept that. Guilty! Guilty! After the verdict, O.J. Simpson emerged from the Santa Monica courthouse. He made his way through a crowd of hecklers, reporters, and news cameras. Justice! Justice! As the victims' families left the courthouse, they were surrounded by hundreds of supporters. Despite being held responsible for Ron and Nicole's death, O.J. Simpson was able to leave the Santa Monica courthouse knowing he was not going to prison. Before heading home to his Brentwood mansion, he stopped at an ice cream store to pick up some cookie dough ice cream for his daughter, Sydney. The same ice cream that Nicole had bought for their daughter on the night she was murdered. The Simpson civil jury still had to deliberate on punitive damages. Jurors would have to ask themselves what was Simpson's net worth and how much should he pay as punishment for the killings. California law states that you can't financially ruin someone, but many legal experts believe that this jury tried to do just that. The jury in the wrongful death civil trial ordered O.J. Simpson to pay $25 million in punitive damages to the families of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown. Simpson was not in the courtroom when the damages were announced. Instead, he learned about the enormous judgment against him while on the golf course. The plaintiffs had told the jury that Simpson would be able to make millions of dollars in the future from endorsements and selling autographs. They pointed out that soon after the stabbing murders of Ron and Nicole, Simpson had applied for trademarks, hoping to put his name on a variety of products, including, of all things, cutlery. Defense lawyers had argued that Simpson's earning capacity had been forever damaged by the publicity surrounding the case, and that their client was more than $800,000 in debt after spending most of his fortune for his defense in the criminal and civil trials. California law states that punitive damages must be proportionate to a defendant's net worth. 
and that while a jury is allowed to punish someone, it cannot financially destroy them. I don't think uh, it could have been too high. I mean, he took two lives away. What is that worth? He's not going to jail for it. He beat the system. He's out walking around, playing golf. What price has he paid uh, for having uh, killed uh, these two people? What, he plays golf on a public course now? The Simpson case, perhaps more than any other in American justice, spawned a cottage industry. At least 40 books were written about the case. It launched careers and even made Playboy models out of people connected to the case. Some believe the verdict in the civil trial and the exposure of new evidence implicating Simpson will finally put the media circus to rest. It's always going to be an extremely famous case, extremely famous. But the evidence of guilt is so, so clear. Every piece of evidence, not just the scientific evidence, but everything this man said, everything he did, everything points to this man's guilt. There's not one speck of evidence pointing toward his innocence. Put it this way, if Simpson is innocent, as some people still believe, these two people are still alive. Since the verdicts in both the criminal and civil trials, Simpson has been trying to rehabilitate his image for a public that is not eager to accept him. He's a survivor. He fought his way up as a kid with various physical problems and, and fighting the gangs in San Francisco and, and, and made something of himself. I think he'll survive this too. On the day after the verdict, I spoke to him and he said, it's not over yet. What he meant was that his saga in the courts and in the news media certainly is not over yet. For O.J. Simpson, this case will never be over. And for the courts and for the media, it's probably going to be going on for a long time. In March 1997, the plaintiffs began collecting on their judgments against O.J. Simpson. Simpson watched as sheriff's deputies carted out his belongings from his Rockingham mansion. Football jerseys, trophies, even his golf clubs. While legal experts say that the Brown and Goldman families might collect a very small portion of the $33.5 million judgments against Simpson, it is unlikely that they will ever collect it all. But the families have maintained that this case was never about money, but seeking justice. True justice would be him behind bars or on death row, awaiting execution for the murder of my brother and Nicole. This was our only avenue. This was a different case. This was a different trial. In that sense, there was justice. The reality of him just walking out the door, it hurts. You know, it hurts because no matter what we would have done, he still has truly, truly gotten away with it. There can never be true justice in this case, but the most the system could do for us was to give us some sense of justice, some sense of accountability for these two people's lives. That we got, and that was the most we could get, and for that we're grateful. The Simpson civil case was part of a trend in American justice. Someone is acquitted of murder in criminal court, so the families of the victims try to get justice through a lawsuit. The complaint is often heard that this kind of wrongful death suit is all about money, about greedy plaintiffs trying to gouge a defendant with deep pockets. To that charge, Fred Goldman had a provocative response. He offered to tear up the judgments against Simpson if Simpson would simply sign a written confession that he committed the killings. Doing so would not lead to another murder trial since no one can be tried in criminal court for the same offense twice. Once you're acquitted, you're free. To Goldman's offer, Simpson responded, no matter how much money I am offered, I would never confess to a crime which I did not commit. I'm Bill Curtis.